Good morning, everybody. Oh, there it is. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It is truly my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Abby Litwak. Hers is a story of resilience and advocacy. She talks the talk, but more importantly, she walks the walk. She's a shining example um, to us all, and a reminder that it's not enough to formulate opinions and recognize wrongs. We must also take action and look out for one another. Evie is the founder of Witness to Mass Incarceration, which is a storytelling archival project designed to document the experiences of formerly incarcerated women and LGBTQ people. The goal of Witness to Mass Incarceration is to reduce the number of incarcerated people in our country. To help achieve that goal, Witness to Mass Incarceration attends regular meetings with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And Evie, just like she's done here today for us, travels tirelessly across the country, speaking to groups of people. Evie was formerly incarcerated herself in two federal women's prisons. And while incarcerated, that's where her advocacy began. When she walked out of prison, she was homeless, penniless. That still didn't stop her, and she continued her advocacy, which has now grown into this organization, Witness to Mass Incarceration. And in addition to that, her new initiative is the Suitcase Project. Um, she works with college students, just like you guys, and other organizations, with the hopes that she's able to provide fully stocked suitcases to newly released women and LGBTQ people, who they themselves find uh, that they also find themselves homeless and hidden as much as she did. So please help me in very warmly welcoming Evie Litwak today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Now, is this all new, or have, were some of you in the earlier session? OK. So again, where is she? She's not here. I have to thank Myra Luth Oliveras. Utega, and I had to ask her how to pronounce that, uh, for making this happen. This is a thrill for me to be here. Um, I am a formerly incarcerated Jewish lesbian and a daughter of two survivors of the Holocaust. I say that because of all those intersections had an impact, uh, had an impact in prison. I was released from prison four years ago and started um, witness to mass incarceration then. My parents, as I just said, were Holocaust survivors. My mother was 12 when she went into Auschwitz. My father went through 12 concentration and labor camps. Um, the Holocaust, I see the world through a lens of that experience. It, in the Holocaust didn't end in 1945 when they were liberated. It, it, lived in, it lived with me growing up. So they brought me up believing, I'm hearing someone else talk. Should I keep talking? Oh, okay. Um, I was told as a child that whatever they can do to Jewish people, they can do to other people, and it's my responsibility to make sure the world is a safe place and always be responsible for other people. In 2009, 2010, I was living with my mother who uh, couldn't really hear very well, couldn't see very well, and was very challenged in her ability to walk. And in spite of that, <clears throat> she decided to go to my sentencing hearing, which was a three to five hour ride, depending on traffic, to speak to the judge. Um, she stood up and said this, I'm gonna read her exact words. Your Honor, I am a Holocaust survivor. I've suffered enough for a lifetime. My daughter, she's been a fantastic daughter. Without her, I cannot exist. She's been doing everything for me. She feeds me, she shops, and she repeated, I can't do anything, I will not exist without her, not even a day, I will die without her. To which the judge said, your daughter's a monster, and I'm putting her in prison. I was furious, um, because, not because the judge called me a monster, but because he did in front of my mother, and that it was unnecessary to do that, cause her further pain. And I was packing, um, you unpack to go to prison. You can't have any children, you can't have a pocketbook. So you self-surrender to prison with as little on you as you can. So while I was unpacking and writing instructions 
for the next person who I didn't know who was going to take care of my mother. <clears throat> um, she walked in, she's about four foot nine, she's adorable, and she's standing in a walker and, and said, I want to talk to you. I said, okay, I stood up. And she said, prison is going to be harder for you than concentration camp was for me. And I looked at her, I said, mom, you were in Auschwitz. I don't know how you can compare the two. And she said, I was 12 years old, you were 60. And it wasn't until I was in solitary confinement years later that I remembered what she said, which was, I was a kid. I didn't really know what was going on. You're an old woman. You've had a whole life. You're going to remember your whole life every day. And she was right. Um, the minute you step into prison, you know you've left the free world. I was taken into a cold, dingy room. And I think these rooms are cold and dingy intentionally. I had to strip in front of a female officer. I had to pee in front of her. I had to lift my breasts so she could check for contraband. And then I had to bend over and cough so she could check my anus and my vagina to make sure I didn't bring in anything. And in that 10 seconds or 20 seconds that I was bent over, I was more humiliated than at any other point in my life. And in that same 10, 20 seconds, I knew that whatever emotion I felt, whatever I was used to doing, I had to withhold every feeling, because I really wanted to cry, as does everybody. Um, and I knew I had to find a coping zone that I didn't even know that existed in my being. So um, from there, I was put in um, a unit that's for new people, partially for new people. Um, the, it's called the A&L unit. It's primary in, I'm sorry. So newbies walk over to me. I mean, I, see, I have a cold, forgive me. Um, veterans walked over to me and said, if you want to do easy time, stay under the radar. And what that means is, don't let any officer know your name. Don't let any, don't let the warden know your name. Well, that for me lasted about an hour. The warden knew my name, everybody in the whole prison knew my name. I was a baby of the women's movement, gay rights movement, civil rights movement, and I couldn't just check my activism at the door. You know, it was part of who I was. So everybody walks over to you if you're new and they say, oh, are you married, do you have a kid? So after the first person walked over to me and said, are you married, do you have a kid? I said, no, I'm not married, I don't have a kid. Second person, are you married, do you have a kid? No, I'm not married, I don't have a kid. So after the fourth, woman walked over to me and I thought to myself, I've been out for 40 years. I'm not going back in the closet because I'm in prison. And by the way, I came out to my mother, my very progressive mother, who when I told her I was a lesbian said, if Hitler didn't kill me, you will. Which I thought was, it's the title of a book I'm writing and I thought was the greatest line I ever heard. I had to hold back from laughing. My very progressive mother. Um, so the next person, and you're allowed to bring in 25 pictures. And the next person who walked over to me uh, said, you're married, you have a kid? I said, I'm not married. I don't have a kid. I'm a lesbian. And she said, can I see your pictures? So I brought 25 pictures of Allie. Mm -hmm. And so she screamed. She said, this whole white lesbian brought 25 pictures of her dog. So the entire compound, within one hour, knew that I not only brought 25 pictures of the dog, but that I was an open and out lesbian. Now, that was very dangerous for me to have done that. Um, but me being me, I wouldn't, if I had to do it again, I'd still do it the same way, because I have to be who I am. Um, so the woman who ran this unit uh, was a white woman who appeared to send all the black women, as soon as they came in, and all the black and brown women out of this unit and keep it primarily white. But to say she's a racist would be the understatement of the year. But she, um, she, about 10 days after I'm in prison, she said, orders me to go to her office. And I thought, what did I do? What, what could I have possibly done in 10 days? So she said, sit down. <clears throat> and she said to me, I understand you're an open lesbian. So I said, I'm also an open Jew and an open feminist. You know, I wanted her to understand what level this was coming from. And she said, well, it's come to my attention that you're touching women's buttockses. So I'm a North, New York Jewish kid. I know ass and took us. It took me a minute to figure out that buttocks was ass. 
And I looked at it, I said, are you crazy? I haven't been with anybody in 10 years. You think I'm gonna start in here? I totally forgot I was in prison. I'm yelling at an officer. I'm demanding that she bring the people into the room, respectfully over the table. I want them here. I, I, I thought it was a courtroom. I said, I want to see those witnesses. I didn't touch a buttocks. I would know if I touched a buttocks. So she sent me back out. And by the time I got to my bed, which was only down six stairs, my bed had been rolled up, and she had moved me from this quiet unit into a unit that was named the ghetto, thinking that I would be miserable. But the ghetto were all people from the city, so I wasn't miserable. But what she did do is put me in a section called the bus stop. Now, it's an illegal section that the prisons have. So let's say from this table to the back, is the sleeping quarters of where women are, women or men. <clears throat> um, unlike this ceiling, in prison, the ceilings are all fluorescent. There's no, there's no, it, like this, like, it's the whole ceiling. So you get a headache just being in a room, in any room in prison. So in front of the bus stop, at, at, at 11 o'clock when the lights go out in the back, I'm sleeping in a place that's right here. Ten bunks on top of each other. The lights are not turned off, so the person on the upper bunk is about six feet away from fluorescent lights and is not going to sleep. And even on the lower bunk is not going to sleep. And directly in front of me is an ice machine which crashes down every 20 minutes. And on either side are the toilets and showers, which 120 to 150 women are flushing all night or taking showers. So the bus stop was created to make sure you don't sleep. And I didn't. I was kept on the bus stop my entire time for being a lesbian. And they told me so. And they tried to make my life very difficult. Um, the, I'm gonna skip around. They also, when you're older in prison, most of the older women get jobs mopping the floor and then are allowed to sit. But with me, they put me in, um, in landscaping to get me a broom and asked me to sweep the streets uh, with these huge rocks in 100 degree weather. And I had a heart condition. So I was sweeping the streets, and then a truck would come by, the pebbles would come back, and I said, you know, like, why don't we just take all these rocks and move them someplace else to another to another part of the compound. He said, well, then you wouldn't have a job. Now, I'll tell you a story that happened to me while I was sweeping. <clears throat> I never met my mother's father, my grandfather, because he was killed. He was killed in gas chamber. But I remembered while I was sweeping the story, and my mother told me that in 1939, when the Germans came in to lunch, they took the businessmen and the religious leaders away for three weeks. So the last time my mother saw her father, he had jet black hair, jet black beard, stood tall. And when he came back three weeks later, he had been beaten for three weeks. He was completely gray, and he was bent over permanently. And to add insult, they made them sweep in the streets in front of their wives and their children. And for whatever reason, when I was sweeping the streets, I felt like I was sweeping the streets with my grandmother, grandfather that I had never met. It was an incredible feeling. Um, the first day I was in prison, uh, I'm 67. I went to prison at 60. Uh, I hadn't been to a synagogue in 50 years. I mean, I might have gone once a year. But the first day I arrived in prison, for the second day I was in prison, I wanted a prayer book. I have no idea where that came from. And I found myself saying a Jewish prayer that we often say over and over and over again. Because in pr what happens is you have two choices in prison, look forward or look backward. And I chose to look forward and to use anything. You don't make this choice consciously, but if you want to survive, you use any tool in your arsenal to survive. And clearly saying that prayer helped to save my life. Um, so, hang on one second, I'm trying to, okay, so I told you about the bus stop, 
after uh, nine months, I uh, was ordered to see an officer. It turned out that I had won my appeal, that the Second Circuit of New York had overturned my conviction. I had four counts, three tax counts, one count for mail fraud. And that I was only the third case in New York State history to be overturned. But the conviction wasn't entirely overturned. Two counts were overturned, um, and they couldn't come back at me. One count was dismissed, and one was vacated, meaning they could come back after me. So this, this, an officer took me, to, and on her way to her office, she said to me, Litwak, I have to release you. It's four o'clock. Before five o'clock, um, the Second Circuit has ordered you out of, the, out of this prison. You fucked up my dinner. And I was upset because it's like, really? I'm getting out of prison. You can't say a kind word. And unfortunately, that was my experience with the correctional officers that I had. Um, not saying that all of them are bad, but saying I didn't have a good experience. <coughs> So I was out in the free world for two years. Um, and by the way, they put me on a street in West Virginia, gave me a ticket and $30, and the next bus was 12 hours later. So I was in the streets of a town in West Virginia alone, at night, and scared. So the, um, in 1997, I was arrested. It took them 12 years before we went to trial the first time. And then, I was out in the free world for two years, and then I had a trial in 2013. So from 1997 to 2013, they constantly worked on threatening me to try to get me to plead guilty. So they would put me in a small room, standing up with four guys, and say, we're going to get you 25 years to life. I, and I thought to myself, well, what? Even if I didn't pay enough taxes, for what? But they wanted you to plead. They didn't want to do the work to go to trial. And so they said, no jail time. In 1998, no jail time, just plead guilty. Because that's just what they want. They just want you to plead so they can mark up the numbers. And I couldn't do it because I didn't commit the crime. And I couldn't say the words, I'm guilty. So for 16 years, they would call me into small offices and say it's Thanksgiving by Christmas, you'll be raped in prison. And I would, like, I wasn't intimidated. I thought, these guys are nuts. You know, there's something wrong with this whole world. Because I'm not a person who was intimidated before prison. I'm, le I'm even less intimidated. And I thought, this is a crazy system. Um, but that's what they tried to do, and I never pled. So from the time of my arrest to the time of being off probation was 20 years of my life that I lost. And prior to that, I was 45 years old, I was about to retire and work on philanthropy for the rest of my life, work on issues. So my life was upended. I went from being comfortable to being penniless. Um, and they were frustrated with me. So I go back to prison. There's only one area in prison that we have freedom, and that's religion. You could be any religion you want, you can change what religion you are. So we had Wiccans, we had, we had everything on the compound, because they couldn't say no. So six weeks before, uh, I went to Friday night services, Jewish services, and there were about 10 women. Five were Jewish, five were not. But hundreds and hundreds of women went to Catholic and Christian services. It was something to do and a way to have some hope. So. Six weeks before the Jewish holiday of Passover, we were given, uh, we eat different food during that holiday. We eat kosher for Passover food. So we're given a list that we can make special purchases from. So it has chocolate covered matzah, chocolate covered this, chocolate covered that. You don't see that on the compound. So as soon as I got the list, I had like, you know, 25 people, I'm in on this, you know. I want that, I'll have one of those. And what happens is 35 women convert to Judaism. And so we spread the chocolate matzah to everybody. <clears throat> they also convert because for two nights, for five hours a night, we can do a service. It's a very lengthy service. We can do a service without officers. And it's like not being in hell for two whole nights. So I, I can pray in Hebrew. And I had a friend, Monica, who could pray in Hebrew. 
And she said, do the prayer. So I'm singing this prayer. And after I finish it, the 35 women clap because they think it's a Broadway show when it's really just, you know, <laughs> I'm making a prayer for the bread. So after Passover, everybody became Muslim because it was Ramadan. <laughs> so in, uh, uh, in both prisons, medical care was non-existent. All 1,100 women saw the same physician's assistant. So whether you had migraine, cancer, broken leg, cyst, this physician's assistant said the same thing to everyone. You're fat, walk on the track, drink water. So a woman named Miriam Hernandez, true story, went in to see him. She looked like death. And she said, I feel like I'm going to die. And he said, he gave her the fat speech. Two weeks later, she died. Her gallbladder burst. And I went nuts because a gallbladder would have required a simple blood test, which he could have done. It could have been prevented. And I had seen too many women die in prison, which is an untalked about story, really untalked about story. Um, so I was so upset that I wrote, and I'm a writer, so I wrote an article and <coughs> witness had a blog. I would send um, my articles through snail mail. It was the safest way to send things because the officers didn't always read everything that was going outgoing, but on this day, I was so upset about this death that I documented it and sent an email. Now in prison, there's a group of officers whose entire job is to sit in a small office and read all our emails. They're looking to punish us. They're looking for any reason to take away uh, commissary, visitation, to take anything away from us that they can take. And there's a group of officers whose entire job is to listen to our phone calls, and if we say something. So a woman I know who ended up being in solitary with me, um, her lawyer said to her, this is a true story, your, ju your judge is sick, and so she said, well, I guess that's a good thing. So they reported that as a threat to her judge, and they put her in solitary for almost a year. And she was, an old, she was older than I was. And solitary is really difficult for anybody. Um, OK, so an hour after it was posted, I was arrested, shackled, taken to solitary, and told, you're going to be in here past your um, release date. My release date was in, uh, in a month. And they said, we're keeping you as long as we want to keep you. And they could have kept me three years, because I had three years probation. So it was very dangerous for me to have sent that email, but I was so angry that someone died again, I couldn't do anything but send it. Um, solitary confinement is a place that's run by four or five officers who answer to nobody. There's no structure to which they answer to. So they can do whatever they want to do in that little world. Solitary w was filled with 60 women when I was there. I was kept in for seven weeks. Um, most of the women, and I said this early on, I'll say it again, <clears throat> most of the women I was in solitary with were there for retaliation because an officer said, asked them to have sex and they declined or the officer was concerned that they would talk. So there were 60 women in prison. You're given a t-shirt, a pair of shorts, um, oh my God, a jumpsuit, I forgot my English. A uh, jumpsuit and a thin blanket, no pillow. And they keep the temperature freezing, like in the 50s. And I'm anemic, I'm older, and I had to wear everything that they gave me, including the blanket. And I was frozen. And when I asked them for a second blanket, they wouldn't give it to me. Um, now I'm going to ask you to think about this. Everybody, think about yourself, not in a college dorm bathroom, but visualize a bathroom in your home. It's a small space, right? Imagine you sitting either on your toilet or standing up. No phone, no, cell, no TV, no laptop, nothing to write with, nothing to do. You don't have a bathtub or shower there, you don't have, you don't have a medicine cabinet, and your windows are blocked. So you're going to sit in that room. If I asked you, in this audience, how many people think 
they could sit in their toilet for 24 hours. One day, how many people think you could do that without, with nothing to do? 12 hours? I'm gonna make you do that. Anybody who raises their hand gets challenged by me. Well, I've, I've been really good, so I've done it. Okay. Well, if you've been in solitary, you can do it again. Uh, so you don't count. <laughs> um, most people can't do it. What I suggest you do is go to your bathroom with nothing and see if you can sit there for an hour. And then understand that there are 80,000 people. Many, 20% of those people are under the age of 20 who are sitting in solitary every day losing their minds. Um, I had high blood pressure. When I got into the cell, I started to have very bad migraines, which I didn't have in prison. And I had vertigo, and I suspected my blood pressure was spiking. It took them two weeks to take my blood pressure. And when they took it, it was 200 over 100, which is stroke territory. So I looked at the you know, physician's assistant, I said, my, both sides of my family have heart disease. I do not want to have a stroke in prison. Take me to the hospital. Because if it's an emergency, which it rarely is, they'll take you to the hospital. He said, no, we get 75000 if you die from an insurance policy, so I'm not taking you. And I thought, I could really die here. Um, the most offensive thing that goes on in every women's prison, and I know this because it's still currently an issue, is they don't give us toilet paper. When you're not in solitary, they give you two rolls, and if you run out, that's it. So in solitary, you have no place to go to ask another person if you could borrow a roll. You can't bargain with anybody. You can't try to steal a roll. Uh, so the officer gave me one roll. And I'm someone who's had uh, lots of surgery around my stomach and my colon. <coughs> so when I asked him for another roll, he looked at me with a smile and said, wipe yourself. And I looked at him. I wasn't going to give him any kind of pleasure any faith, I wouldn't move a muscle in my goddamn face, but I was thinking, fuck you, you know, but I wouldn't say it. And he waited as long as he wanted to, to humiliate me and not give me that role. And by the way, when I came out of prison, and I was in halfway house, the first thing I wanted was like a really good cup of coffee, because you don't have coffee in prison. And I made enough money to have four dollars to buy a really strong cup of coffee. I walked into a Brooklyn roasting house. They give you an hour to leave. And I ordered my coffee, went into the bathroom, and in front of me were 48 dozen rolls of toilet paper. <laughs> and I thought, I gotta steal some. I'm, you know, that's my first, I took pictures of it. Everywhere to this day that I go, I see every toilet paper roll. And on several occasions, I actually have taken one. The guilty as hell. But even my mo in my mother's assisted living, where I go every two weeks, I make sure she has three rolls of toilet paper. But I'm not the only one who will tell you that story. But it's true. I see toilet paper wherever I am. So 60 women are screaming, not at the same time, but 24 hours a day, 60 women are screaming, get me the fuck out of here at the top of their lungs in solitary confinement. And here we go. You're listening to women losing their minds. You're listening to people who are suicidal. You're, you're hearing it. And my uh, cellmate was a 67-year-old woman who was used to seeing her husband every weekend for visiting, and in solitary, she was only allowed to see him for an hour, so it wasn't financially, it didn't make sense for him to come. And if you're in solitary, they shackle you and take you to the visitor center, so she didn't want to do it. So she was banging her head against the cement wall till it bled. And I had to take care of her while I was taking care of myself, because I could see she was going to kill herself. And I, I, I didn't know how to deal with it. But it's a lot of pressure if you're trying to survive. No toilet paper, you're freezing, you physically don't feel good, women are screaming, get me the fuck out of here, and you've got someone banging their head. It's way too much pressure. And these cages, this 
whoever came up with solitary should be shot. Uh, but it may be the most important issue that outside of the death penalty, any solitary confinement in America is uh, one of the most important issues as far as I'm concerned. Many women tried to commit suicide. Many were successful. I didn't try to commit suicide, but I did think, if I don't wake up tomorrow, that's okay. It'd be okay. I've had a good life. And when I came out of prison, the first year was very hard, as is the fourth year. Um, the first year I was out, I would see a bus coming and think to myself, because it was so hard to get a job, it was so hard to make ends meet. Excuse me. I have a little creature here. Um, that I thought, I'll walk in front of the bus. At some, down in the subway, I thought, I'll step off and just end it, because it's just that hard. And I'm the most optimistic, forward-thinking, positive person, but there, there comes a level where you just break down. And the only reason I think that I didn't walk in front of the bus is because I love my dog, and I didn't want to leave her to nobody. And I'm serious about that. Little things keep you alive that you don't expect. So, I returned home. I was released from solitary, which is not a good idea, because you're you have no sense of time or what day it was. I was uh, put on a Greyhound bus, as I said, given $30. I, I went to Port Authority and met no one. And it was very overwhelming to be back in New York, to be in Port Authority, to be alone. Um, and I didn't want to cry, but I found a place and did. And I didn't know what to do. I had to report to, uh, because I was homeless and penniless, I had to report to a halfway house. I'm one of 700,000 people that come home every year, most of whom are homeless and penniless. You have 147,000 people in prison, and they're all going to come home. And probably 10% of them come home. And I often wonder, where are these 14,000 people in Texas? Who's taking care of them? And the answer is, not many people. Even though there's deep concern, you got to take it to another level to make it happen. Um, so I, with, I had a social security check because I'm disabled. And uh, I went to a women's shelter, 11 women, one bathroom, no heat. And so one of the women, uh, one of the women went and opened the oven and sat next to it and then lit a cigarette. And I thought, if I didn't die in prison, this house is going to get blown up because this idiot is smoking. So I, I, you're still in danger, even though you're outside prison. So I went to nonprofits um, that serve formerly incarcerated people. I had worked 30 years. I had a resume. I sent out 200 applications. I didn't get a call back. Um, I now know that the only way to get a job is through a person walking you right into that job or other people helping you walk into that job. No one I know in the New York area has a job. We're all just struggling, trying to be activists in the field, picking up work here and there as we can. Um, very few people have jobs. But, um, so I went to all the nonprofit <coughs> services for housing, I could not find any help. And the nonprofit services serving formerly incarcerated people were offering two week employment training, a resume, three interviews with a construction firm or a food service, which I couldn't do, <clears throat> and uh, a hot meal if you wanted. And I thought, they're getting $18 million for this? This is nuts. <clears throat> if you give me half a million dollars and 10 incarcerated formerly incarcerated people, I'll have a job bank in one year. And it'll be real jobs. Because we're not about bureaucracy. We're about let's cut it through it and make it happen. Because we want to start our lives again. I understood <clears throat> poverty for the first time. Because I had to make a choice between eating a 30 cent bagel or a dollar piece of pizza. And I didn't want to eat like that. But I had no money. So that, those were my, uh, my options. So after being homeless for 16 months, I ran into an old friend that um, I worked with in the women's movement back in the 70s. And I hadn't seen her, she hadn't seen me. 
I realized she must have cancer. I said, how are you? Um, she said, I have breast cancer, but I knew, because she had no hair, and she said, how are you? Figuring she was gonna get this great answer, and I said, I was incarcerated. And she said, you? And she said, where are you living? I said, in a homeless shelter. She said, you're not gonna stabilize at all unless you have a room of your own. It can be a tiny room, but it has to be your own room. She was 100% correct. I didn't listen to her, and she found me again. And she had a friend who had two nonprofit buildings in a great section of New York in the Upper West Side. And she got me a tiny room. And the moment I moved my own things and I had saw my own coffee cup from before, the moment I had that key and closed the door was the first time I felt safe in God knows how many years. But I said to her, if I use my social security check to pay rent, I have no money for food, the telephone, a metro card. She said, we'll figure that out later. I said, I'm not getting hired. A, I'm old, and B, I'm a convicted felon. And so she said, we'll get you a job. When she realized I couldn't get a job, she sat down and said, I'm going to send you a check for $1,000 a month for a year so that you can survive. And I will tell you, without having her, I probably would not be here. A little, that little kindness, that, that help, that reaching out saved my life, gave me enough time to build my organization, to make a reputation. Um, and that's unbelievable, which is why I believe the focus of every person's life should be to help one person every day, even in little ways because it goes so far and it means so much. Now, there are six million people that are on, there are 2.3 million people in prison, but there are six million who are on parole or probation or under supervised release. There's, I had to, I was one of the people that were least afraid of that, that I was gonna commit a crime, and yet I had to call to ask permission to go visit my mother. Parole and probation is very heavy handed. And a friend of mine had a map, they want to push it in the direction of ankle monitoring, which would be a nightmare for us. Because that means they can, they know when we're peeing 24 hours a day. That's not a good thing. Because um, you'd be on a computer and being watched. At least I knew when I had a probation officer, I had to come in this time, I had to call for permission, I had to file this. So, a friend of mine was being woke up at 12, 3, 6. She didn't sleep because the, the probation officer was checking in on her. Why would you check in on her to see if she's sleeping? You just woke her up. But it's crazy stuff. So the other thing we need to object to, which is very lucrative, is post-prison parole and probation, which is just, I mean, I these judges give absurd uh, amounts of probation. You have a crime, you did your time, Six months, you should be on probation. I know a woman who has two life sentences and 10 years probation. What's she gonna do, come down from heaven? She's dead. <laughs> and do 10 years? I, why would you give 10 years after she dies? This is like crazy. So anyway, my friend had, uh, was not allowed to use a cell phone. And her mother was dying, and her daughter was with her, and her daughter passed didn't even give her the phone, put the phone next to her ear to say goodbye to her mother, and her mother passed away. My friend was stupid, and I would have done the same thing. She was honest. She told her probation officer this happened. The probation officer sent her back to prison for six months. It's too nuts. If I were here for seven days, you would be amazed at how nuts this really, from beginning to end, the justice system is. It, it, it's having been in it, I and I and I'll say to you that at age 45, when I was set to retire and live in East Hampton and do philanthropy, I would never have known the suffering of millions and millions of people. To some extent, I'm glad I went to prison because now I have the firsthand experience to help people who are suffering, and I think that's important. Um, during the Kavanaugh hearings, Lindsey Graham said he doesn't want to ruin a man's life over one useful error. I happen to agree with him, except that we have two million people who have one useful error, and probably 300,000 people that really committed crimes. 
So if you want to forgive people for a useful error or a mistake, and if uh, people want to, in politics and government, have second chances, then they need to release people from prison, particularly pot lifers, when they're make, making money off of it. They need to release the elderly who are harmless and have a zero recidivism rate, and they need to reduce uh, and not allow for any teenager to ever see the inside of the prison cell. Um, but unfortunately, the truth is, if you're a person of color, you're more likely to be in prison than not. Because that's how our system works. Um, so I want to just, I think I'm going to just talk to you about witness a little bit. Witness to mass incarceration uh, is my attempt to create a digital library for filmmakers and educators and people to see. So to get, I do a four to six hour interview about life before, during, or after. Um, and I ca capture, the reason I do it about life before is I want people to know that these people have families, have mothers, have children. They, they, they were just like you. And then something happened that altered the course, course of their life. Now, one of the reasons, and uh, so I'm building that library, and I take interviews around the country, and I work with an amazing team. Some of you saw the five minute interview we did first thing in the morning. <clears throat> the Suitcase Project is my effort to build a little bit of a movement. N nobody can survive without a community. If you don't have a community of people around you, it's very, we're tra I'm traumatized for the rest of my life from having been in solitary, from having been in prison. When a police officer walked into my building, I thought she was there for me. There are so many triggers and so much trauma that we have that's unmeasurable by anybody. Um, and we need help. So the way to help, uh, the, what reentry must be having your arms around a person and knowing what they need completely. Because offering them one thing is not going to do the trick. So my project is my effort to get synagogues, because that's my home base, to raise $2,000 per suitcase, not just to have uh, a cell phone and a laptop and a and $800 for clothes, but to get five members of the congregation to meet someone in prison when they walk out, take them home, give them the suitcase, have lunch with them, and invite them so that they have a community they can go to, to teach people that walking out into this strange world is a very hard thing to do. The other project that, um, I happen to be sitting on the flight here yesterday, next to the Northeast Head of Marketing for Toyota Lexus. So I said to her, hey, do you guys do any charity? And she said, yeah, mostly focus on kids. And I said, well, do you think you could consider hiring, writing a pledge and considering, yeah, big girl, yeah. Um, hiring, committing to hire one formerly incarcerated person. Because I'm going to walk around and make these corporations sign a pledge that they will hire one formerly incarcerated person, then two, then three. But you have to start with one. Um, so that's another project I'm doing. But as people heard earlier, there's a lot of things going around in this country. I've passed you two cards. One is mine. The other one says donate. You do not have to donate. But I'm asking you to text um, witness to 83224 to get on my mail, my texting list. There'll come a point in time where I'll want some help working on getting a policy change with your faculty uh, to make sure that incarcerated people are evacuated during times of hurricanes. And I will need other voices to help me. I don't need you, if you do that one thing and come on my list, I'll just text you and say, call your senator and say you, you want to do this. It's very effective. Um, and nobody has that list but me. I respect people's privacy. So, I will tell you that I do this 24 hours a day. I do this seven days a week. I, there's nothing you can't ask me, and there's nothing uh, that will stop me from doing this the rest of my life. But I, we, formerly incarcerated people, we incarcerated people, and all of our allies cannot do this alone. I go to universities because I want at least some of you in the room 
to consider doing something for another, helping someone out. If it's not a formerly incarcerated person, let it be something else. But don't let your day go by without doing one thing, and one text. Because even sending one letter to someone inside prison makes their day. Because if they don't have family, that's the only letter they might get in five years. So every little bit that any human being can do will help. So I want to thank you for listening to me. And I'm ready to take your questions. I want to say to you that I have, in, I have a particular interest in working in Texas because of hurricanes, because of the case of Crystal Mason, which I told the earlier uh, group about. There was a <clears throat> woman who did three years for tax evasion, came out, and her mother said, go vote for Hillary. It was 2016. She went to vote. She wasn't on the register. She filled out a provisional ballot which wasn't counted. And she was sent, that she was uh, arrested, convicted of voter fraud, and sentenced to five years in prison. And she just reported last week. I'm outraged by this case. If you can make a mistake, that it, then that shouldn't qualify. And something has to be done. We have to break the back of this Herculean monster. So I, this is a state where I'd like to work. I hope some of you, faculty and students, have an interest. Because there are research projects to do. There are pilot projects to start small in any of the areas that I'm talking about. And I can I think of a dozen ways in which you can make an impact. So I hope there will be interest. And I will come back and mentor anybody who will work with faculty and mentor anybody who wants to work on this issue. So questions? something it's a little political I apologize I hope not to offend anybody but if there's been a DA who's been in office in the last 20 years for 20 years you probably want a new one more of a reformist you need to pay attention to sheriffs to prosecutors to judges <coughs> do not only think this vote is about the president or Congress or the Senate which you should be actively involved in because our midterm elections had 16% of this country, that's insane. We have the right, I mean, uh, we, formerly incarcerated people, don't have the right in 34 states, and we're working hard to get it. You have the right, you need to vote. So my question is, do you think that the problem is for-profit prisons? No. Okay. For-profit prisons is, a, is an afterthought. Prisons were, I'll tell you a way in which prisons make money, whether they're profitable or not profitable. Uh, food in prison is undescribable. It, when I ate it, I threw up. So the only way to survive, particularly if you're older or you have stomach issues, is commissary. Being able to buy a little tuna fish, a piece of bread, and eat it. I ate the same thing every night. Um, <clears throat> and you get $300, roughly $320 to spend the commissary. So if it's, if so if it's 2.3 million people in prison, assume half of the people, about 1 million, don't have any money, and assume 1 million have money. And this is one line item of the prison's budget. So 1 million times $300 is $300 million. The state of Texas gets $50 million for commissary towards their state budget. They don't want to lose that money. So prisons have earned, we have email, we have visitation, we have JPay. They earn money off of us, and they jack up the prices of noodles from 25 to $1.25. Sneakers that you could buy for $30 or $120. It's a ridiculous system. But they make so much money, which is why we have to find a way 
like I said, one hurricane, one evacuation of 100,000 100, people in Texas will break the back of prisons. And there are people like me who have been activists all our lives who are going for, as we say, the gold. I really don't want to see a tweak. It turn, turns my stomach because then people can check a box and say, well, we did nothing. No. I want to see it. I want to see a system that if you have a drug or gambling problem, you get therapy, you, you can go away, but in order to get help. If you, there, everybody in Texas, um, there was a 17 year old girl who ran away from home to be with five other people who ran away from home. Um, one, per one person, they were going to steal a car and run away, but they couldn't get the keys. So one person, unbeknownst to the other four, uh, went inside to get the keys and killed, shot the owner and murdered her. And you have a little law in Texas called felony murder. So the four other teenagers got life without parole because they wanted to run away. This one particular girl, if she was willing to talk, she's now a 50-year-old woman who was recently released, um, was being um, abused by her father, her stepfather. Most of these kids come from situations like that and they're running away. Five lives are destroyed. There's no reason for that. You don't put someone in prison for 30 years. If they're 17 when they make a mistake and you really insist on them paying for their crime, it doesn't take 10 years to know. By the time you're in prison five years, you know everything you need to know for any crime. Unless you're mentally ill to a point that you are dangerous. But most people are middle-aged people, let them go. But don't just let them go. Let them go with a plan. And there is no plan. And people don't take into account housing, jobs, trauma. Those are the three most important things for reentry. Um, and they don't take, and you've got to bundle it together or you can't do it. wondering um, if you are familiar with what st the status is on like removing the box from job applications. I know, I believe some states have been successful in getting that removed, but you could talk about that. You may not like my answer. That's one of the tweakers that I really don't like. I don't disrespect people working on it. My problem is the internet. So if you manage to get banned the box, if you manage to get it off, which is a good idea, if someone doesn't want to hire you, they're not going to hire you. They're going to put your name in Google and see that you, you're all, everything about me is on the internet. So it doesn't prevent, it doesn't help us get jobs. It's philosophically important to not, it's, as I said in the earlier uh, program, don't ask a person about their crime because then you're making that person their crime. Uh, I'll say, I help the band of box people do well, but what we really need is the ability to clean our records completely so that there are no files on our cases. That's more useful. If you uh, if you convicted a crime and paid your time, seal the case and don't let the information be public. Give us a fighting chance. I just want to know, uh, I was brought up, you know, that if you do something wrong, my kid, my son, one of him, one of him, he was a car incarcerated for five years, but they gave him 10 years probation. I don't see the point of the 10 years probation. I mean, I'm, I agree with you. They need to do something different. And the crime he committed was so small. It's like, the town I'm from, you can murder somebody and get away with it. But he just had maybe two grams of marijuana on him, and they gave him 10 years for something that, to me, that was stupid, you know. There's a former prosecutor in Texas who became a judge, and I, I might recall, and this won't be great, Judge Dean, who on the same day convicted a black 16-year-old teenager to life for one joint and let a white man who murdered someone go free. It's kind of a famous case. He's no longer on the bench. Um, he was disbarred. The idea that you have to do 10 years 
based on five years in prison, is just a way to make money. And the privatization of prisons is a nightmare because, and I was in one, it just means you get less service so they get more profit. And really, you're not gonna have a successful way, that you have to break the back of where they make the profit. And there are ways to do it. But I agree, 10 years probation means, hold it, means that they're employing one whole person to talk to your son for no reason whatsoever. I agree. Hello? Okay. Um, so you mentioned the correctional officers and how awful some of them can be. Do you have any idea how we can maybe correct that behavior or prevent it from becoming a problem? What you're dealing with is a system of power behind the wall, whether it's state or federal prison, where anybody gets power. Unfortunately, I, some of you might know the experiment Stanford University did, where they put half the classes Nazis and half the classes Jews. They had to stop the experiment within hours of it starting, because the people who were in power were actually going to kill the people who were not, and they were all students. You cannot give people power, period. So someone who may be the nicest person in the world walks into that prison and joins a culture where they have power that's unbelievable. They can say anything to anyone. Um, and it's, it's used sexually a lot. Um, how to change it? Well, my small part is I, I have worked very hard with the Department of Justice. I have a grant to convene formerly incarcerated people who were sexually assaulted. And what we intend to tell them is um, not that there are gaps in auditing, but the only way you're going to change the culture of violence that exists in prison is if we go in as formerly incarcerated people and we talk to these officers and they see us as human beings because they do not see us as human beings. I have never been treated the way I was treated in prison by anybody in my life with such, it was, who do you think we are? I, and I have a mother and a father too. But I, I don't blame them. I understand the dynamic of power, but you have to, prison should be run by social workers, not by correctional officers. People need help with addictions. People need help, uh, and a lot of the people are just in there for, uh, I, I told this story earlier and I'll repeat it. One of the women that I was selling with, uh, her husband threatened to divorce her and take the kids. She had no money, so she stole from her company to pay for a lawyer, she won her kids, but she planned this, she knew she'd go to jail, and she made sure her parents were the foster, uh, were assigned the fostering of her kids, and then she was arrested, and the company she stole from went to the district attorney with her, and said, we know why she did this, we support her, we don't want to bring charges. There are more women than you can imagine in there for reasons that are, re that are unbelievable. Yes, she did something wrong. Why not give her community service? Why not uh, give some understanding? What we do is criminalize poverty. Most of the people I was in with couldn't afford to buy a meal if they wanted to. A guy went into a McDonald's, took a soda, he's in jail. Give him the goddamn soda. He's thirsty, he's hungry. Um, the economic inequality, or the inequity, is so bad, it's the worst that I've ever seen it, or the worst that I ever know in history. And it's only gonna get worse. Um, we need to educate, we need to feed, we need to do the right thing by everyone. And that's the goal. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, one last question. Yes. Uh so then, just knowing very little about this program, is the plan to tackle this from starting with the prisons themselves and the structural organization they're in, or would like legislation outside of prisons, such as mandatory minimum sentences and things of that nature? Well, the plan is to educate the public because we are not a group of survivors that are perceived of as sympathetic. So the first layer of the plan is for me and other people to talk to as many people as we can so that you look at me and understand that people like 
that everybody like me should not necessarily be in prison and have a little empathy. We are also not a danger. So we have a whole education program to tell communities we're not a danger to you. And actually, we're probably among your best workers. The next level is to get engaged so that communities start helping us rebuild our lives, which are completely in shatters. Um, we often, nobody really wants to hire us. And believe me, you want to hire an incarcerated person because they've been used to structure for years and they, they're good workers. And because they want to survive. They want, they want to be out of prison. There's a myth of recidivism that's nonsense. There's actually no good measure of recidivism breaking down the, the recidivism that's technical, meaning violations, versus a crime. The, at least at the Bureau of Prisons, they won't break that down. And I assure you that it's not what you think. So the first level is to get all of you on board to start reading, start thinking, start being aware that there are incarcerated people, that they have that they're traumatized, and then get you engaged. What I specifically would like to do is do some research um, using the formerly incarcerated population, do, whether it be surveying them or interviewing them to identify things where policy papers can be written and sent to legislators. Um, but it's really just getting people to know that we are probably 10% of the room right here, or 20% of the room. Um, we don't want. We shouldn't be silent. As a openly, um, as an open lesbian, I understand. Forty years ago, when I came out, I was facing guys with two by fours, you know, who wanted to hurt me. Forty years later, I don't face that prejudice. Uh, we need the same. The prejudice that's against us is the same prejudice that's against anybody. The othering of immigrants. The othering of. Um, uh, formerly incarcerated people, the othering of anybody has to stop. I hate the divisiveness in this country. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm going to be the unother. We're going to make sure we're all the same. We have all the same desires, all the same needs, and those who can need to help those who can't. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That last time my statement was down. Thank you all for coming. I would like to remind all of you to fill out your evaluation forms, please, particularly if you're a student that's of the utmost importance, because that will let you know your professor that you've attended. And thank you so much for being here. And have a good afternoon. <laughs>